Hello and welcome to Oak Island Theories. In this video, we're going to explore the theory that members of a Renaissance secret society are behind the Oak Island mystery. Let's take a look. Some believe that a mysterious post-Renaissance fraternity whose members are known as the Rosicrucians might be behind the Oak Island mystery. The Rosicrucian Fraternity, also known as the Fraternity of the Rose Cross and the Order of the Rosy Cross, is a secret society which is said to have been founded in Germany during the late medieval period. It is said that members were keepers of ancient philosophical and scientific wisdom, which had been passed down to them by Arabian wise men and Maghrebian Moors. For 120 years after their founding, the Rosicrucians purportedly kept their knowledge secret fearing that the intellectual climate in Europe was not ready for it. Then, in 1614, they published the first of what have come to be known as the Rosicrucian Manifestos, documents revealing their secret history and general philosophy. The Rosicrucian doctrine quickly spread throughout Europe, engendering a 17th century furor which has been termed by Renaissance historian Dame Francis Yates the Rosicrucian Enlightenment. Although no one has openly admitted to being a member of the Fraternity of the Rose Cross, a member of European intellectuals have championed the secret society's philosophies in their writings. Some have long been suspected of having some involvement with the Rosicrucian Fraternity. These potential members include prominent artists and scientists such as William Shakespeare, Ben Jonson, Francis Bacon, Dr. John Dee, and Fernando Pessoa. One of the most difficult problems with the theory that the Order of the Rosy Cross might have some connection with the Oak Island mystery is the fact that no one is really sure that the society actually existed at all. The only real evidence we have supporting its existence are the Rosicrucian Manifestos. The first manifesto, Fama Fraternitatis, was published in Kassel, Germany in 1614. It tells the story of the Order's founder, a man named Father C.R. The manifesto explains how Father C.R., while still a young man, set off on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. On the way, he stopped in Damascus, where he learned medicine and mathematics from the so-called wise men of Damasco. After three years, he left Damascus and traveled to Egypt by ship, before sailing further east along the southern coast of the Mediterranean Sea to the city of Fez in North Africa. There, he learned science, alchemy, and philosophy from the city's so-called elementary inhabitants. He spent two years in Fez before sailing to Spain, where he tried to impart all he had learned in his travels to the Spanish scholars. The scholars were proud, however, and unwilling to admit their knowledge was lacking, they rejected the teachings of Father C.R. The German continued to travel throughout Europe, trying to share the wisdom he had learned with whomever would listen but was similarly rejected by the academic authorities of the day. Finally, he settled in Germany, where he and seven others formed a secret brotherhood known as the Fraternity of the Rosy Cross. The brothers agreed to spread themselves throughout Europe so that they could, as a whole, better understand the areas in which European knowledge was lacking. They also agreed to cure the sick free of charge, convene with each other once a year, find worthy successors for themselves, and keep their fraternity secret for 100 years. The manifesto goes on to tell of how the Rosicrucian Brotherhood, many years after their founding, discovered the tomb of Father C.R. in a seven-sided vault. When they opened the casket, they found Father C.R.'s body, quote, whole and unconsumed, unquote, holding an important parchment book, which, next to the Bible, was the Rosicrucian's greatest treasure. Many believe Fama Fraternitatis was not meant to be taken literally, but is rather an allegory laced with symbolic meaning. Others believe that the manifesto was a hoax, carried out in the hopes that it might popularize the notion of spreading knowledge among Europe's lower classes. Some, however, believe that the document is the first piece of evidence proving the existence of the Rosicrucians. If the latter is truly the case, the second piece of evidence was published a year later, once again in Castle, Germany. The second Rosicrucian Manifesto, the 1615 Confessio Fraternitatis, addresses a number of misgivings people have had about the Fraternity of the Rosy Cross following the publication of Fama Fraternitatis, asserting that the Brotherhood is not heretical and that its members, quote, acknowledge themselves truly and sincerely to profess Christ, unquote. 
It also invites the learned of Europe to be open-minded to new knowledge and philosophies, and implies that the Rosicrucians were preparing to reform the prevailing intellectual status quo in Europe. The Rosicrucian manifestos were hugely popular at the time of their publication, as many intellectuals at the time found the notion of an impending cultural revolution, compounded with the apparent existence of a secret society privy to esoteric knowledge, to be very exciting. In the years following the publication of the manifestos, academics all over Europe attempted to get in touch with the Rosicrucians, all of them apparently without success. In 1616, a pamphlet entitled The Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz was published anonymously in Germany. Some considered it to be the third of the Rosicrucian manifestos. However, as it was dissimilar in style and content to the previous manifestos, some rejected the idea that it was truly Rosicrucian. The Chemical Wedding tells the story of a man named Christian Rosenkreutz, who was identified as the Father C.R. from Fama Fraternitatis. The story is an allegoric romance chock full of alchemic symbolism, which tells of how Rosenkreutz was invited to a magical castle in order to assist with the wedding of a king and queen. Over the years, many academics have theorized that the Rosicrucians were the predecessors of the Freemasons, members of a fraternity which was formed in Scotland in the early 1700s. Some have even suggested that the Order of the Rosy Cross was a descendant of the medieval Christian military order, the Knights Templar. Others suspect that the Order was never a real fraternity at all, and that the Rosicrucian Manifestos were nothing more than well-intentioned hoaxes perpetrated by anonymous pioneers of the Age of Enlightenment. Many proponents of the theory that Rosicrucians buried treasure on Oak Island maintain that the Money Pit's contents consist of a preserved corpse, important documents, and treasures from the Temple of Solomon. In Fama Fraternitatis, the first of the Rosicrucian Manifestos, members of the Order of the Rosy Cross discovered the body of their founder, Father C.R., entombed in a seven-sided vault. Although the body had lain there for many years, it was perfectly preserved. Some people believe that the Rosicrucians who came to Oak Island similarly buried the corpse of one of their high-ranking members, preserved through the process of mummification, brining, or treatment with mercury, along with their treasure. Fama Fraternitatis also claims that the body of Father C.R. was clutching a very important parchment document. Some believe that the Rosicrucians buried this same mysterious document, or perhaps some other important documents, on Oak Island. Candidates include medieval Rosicrucian texts revealing long-lost wisdom, the lost works of Sir Francis Bacon, and the original handwritten manuscripts of William Shakespeare. Some who believe the Rosicrucians have a connection with Freemasonry and the Knights Templar maintain that the Rosicrucians buried treasure from the Temple of Solomon on Oak Island. Some speculate that this treasure might include sacred religious artifacts such as the Ark of the Covenant and the Menorah. According to the Hebrew Bible, the Ark of the Covenant is the chest containing the stone tablets on which Moses inscribed the Ten Commandments. The Ark, which was gilded entirely with gold and fitted with a golden lid depicting two cherubim, was carried by the Israelites during their forty years of wandering in the Sinai Desert. When the Israelites built Solomon's Temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, the Ark was placed inside a sacred room within the Temple, called the Holy of Holies. In 587 BC, when the Babylonian Emperor Nebuchadnezzar II laid siege to Jerusalem, the Babylonian army looted Solomon's Temple and carried its treasures back to Babylon. There is no record of the Ark of the Covenant being among the booty, however and ever since the Siege of 587 BC, its whereabouts have been disputed. The menorah is a seven-branched lampstand of pure gold which, according to the Book of Exodus, was crafted in the Sinai Desert under the direction of Moses. This lampstand, which was built at the same time as the Ark of the Covenant, was to dwell inside the tabernacle, a sacred portable tent erected as a dwelling place for God, which also housed the Ark. Later on, the menorah was placed within the Holy of Holies in Solomon's Temple, along with the Ark of the Covenant. The menorah, like the Ark, disappeared during the Babylonian siege of 587 BC. Although the Babylonians kept meticulous records of their plunder, the menorah was never mentioned in their writings. In 516 BC, a second temple was built on the Temple Mount. This temple also employed the use of a menorah although the Hebrew Bible does not clarify whether this was the same golden menorah which was crafted under the direction of Moses during the Exodus, or an entirely new lampstand. 
Centuries later, in 70 AD, in the midst of the First Jewish-Roman War in which the Judean Jews rebelled against Roman rule, the Roman Emperor Titus besieged Jerusalem with three legions. The Romans retook Jerusalem and destroyed much of the city, including the Second Temple. After ransacking the city, the legions returned to Rome. The Arch of Titus, built in Rome to commemorate the victory, depicts a triumph or victory procession that ensued and reveals that the menorah of the Second Temple was one of the spoils recovered from Jerusalem. Many historians believe that the menorah was later carried off to Carthage in present-day Tunisia by the Vandals following their sack of Rome in 455. It likely remained there until 533, when the Byzantine Empire subdued the Vandalic Kingdom of Carthage and returned to Constantinople, the Byzantine capital, with the Vandal treasure. According to Procopius, a Byzantine scholar, the menorah was later returned to Jerusalem. There have been no records of the menorah since. According to popular legend, however, it was recovered by the Knights Templar during the Crusades and later brought to Scotland when the order was excommunicated on Friday, October 13, 1307. For years, certain academics and scholars have argued that the Rosicrucians likely had something to do with the Oak Island mystery. One of the most recent and well-researched arguments supporting the Rosicrucian theory is the one presented by Norwegian organist and amateur cryptographer Petter Amundsen. Amundsen, who resides in Oslo, Norway, claims that he has uncovered hidden messages in several 17th century publications, including the First Folio, the 1623 published collection of William Shakespeare's plays, which suggests that the plays and sonnets attributed to William Shakespeare were, in fact, authored by the English nobleman Sir Francis Bacon, that the Shakespearean works were a Rosicrucian project, and that the Rosicrucians buried a treasure of historic and religious value in Oak Island's swamp. Amundsen presents his incredible theory, along with reams of supporting evidence, in several books and films. Amundsen's quest began while he was reading The Tunnel Through the Air, a 1927 science fiction novel written by William Delbert Gann. Gann was a finance trader who, in the early 1900s, developed unorthodox technical analysis tools with which he claimed he could forecast the stock market. Eerily, many of Gann's predictions, even some not related to the stock market, appear to have come true. Some believe that Gann concealed some of his most valuable trading secrets inside the tunnel through the air through the use of codes and ciphers. According to the book's foreword, quote, The tunnel through the air is mysterious and contains a valuable secret, clothed in veiled language, unquote. Amundsen, who dabbled in the stock market himself, hoped to uncover this valuable secret and apply it to stock trading. On page 126 of the book, Amundsen came across a sentence which made him pause and scratch his head. The sentence reads, Lord Bacon, the literary genius and philosopher, lifted the Bible one day above his head and said, There God speaks. The Lord Bacon the sentence refers to is the English Renaissance man Sir Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon was an English philosopher, parliamentarian, scientist, legal expert, and writer who lived from 1561 to 1626. Many consider Bacon to be the father of the scientific method, the formulation of a hypothesis through observation, measurement, and experimentation and the Napoleonic Code, a civil code established by French dictator Napoleon Bonaparte in 1804. Bacon also played an instrumental role in the colonization of the British colonies in North America. What caused Amundsen to take a second look at this particular sentence were the facts that, although Francis Bacon was certainly a prolific writer, he is not typically considered to be a literary genius, and to the best of his knowledge, there were no records of Bacon lifting a Bible above his head and saying, There God speaks. Amundsen suspected that this strange sentence might be a clue that would help him unravel the mystery of Gann's book. Steganographers, people who conceal hidden messages in larger, otherwise normal-looking messages, often make intentional mistakes in the larger, innocuous message in order to indicate that there is more to it than meets the eye. In order to verify to himself that the sentence in Gann's book might indeed be one such intentional error, Amundsen read up on Francis Bacon to see if there were any references to him raising a Bible above his head and saying, There God Speaks. While researching Francis Bacon, Amundsen learned that the English Renaissance man was the inventor of a binary alphabet, which could be used to conceal messages within text. In this alphabet, every letter of the Latin alphabet is replaced with a five-character string in which each character is either an A or a B. 
For example, the letter A becomes A A A A A. The letter B becomes A A A A B. The letter C becomes A A B A, etc. If a steganographer wanted to conceal a smaller code in a larger one using this alphabet, he or she would have to find a way to make two distinct categories of letters. One of the letter categories would represent A, while the other letter category would represent B. To find the secret message in this text, we first have to separate it into five letter blocks. Then we have to turn each letter into either an A or a B. In this message, lowercase letters turn into A and capital letters turn into B. Finally, we use Francis Bacon's binary alphabet to find the letter which corresponds to each five-character block. The secret message is thus revealed. After learning about Bacon's binary alphabet, Amundsen came across the 1900 book The Cipher in the Plays and on the Tombstone, written by former U.S. Congressman Ignatius Donnelly. In his book, and in an earlier 1888 book entitled The Great Cryptogram, Francis Bacon's Cipher in Shakespeare's Plays, Donnelly claims to have discovered codes in the sonnets and plays of the famous English poet and playwright William Shakespeare. According to Donnelly, these codes, when decrypted, indicate that many of the Shakespearean works were, in fact, actually written by Sir Francis Bacon. Donnelly further claims that the inscription on Shakespeare's tombstone contains a code which can be deciphered using Bacon's binary alphabet. When deciphered, the tombstone message suggests a Shakespeare-Bacon connection. Shakespeare's tomb is located in the chancel, the space around the altar, of Holy Trinity Church in the English market town of Stratford-upon-Avon, the playwright's birthplace. Beside Shakespeare's tomb is the grave of his wife, Anne Hathaway, as well as the graves of his daughter Susanna, his son-in-law Dr. John Hall, Susanna's husband, and his grandson-in-law Thomas Nash. The inscription on Shakespeare's tombstone reads, Good friend for Jesus' sake forbear to dig the dust and close it here. Blessed be the man who spares these stones, and cursed be he who moves my bones. There is nothing about the inscription on Shakespeare's tomb which suggests that it might contain a hidden code which could be deciphered using Bacon's binary alphabet. The letters on the stone cannot be divided into two different categories, like uppercase and lowercase. There are no randomly modified letters in boldface or italics which could separate the letters into A's and B's. However, in his book, Donnelly references an article written in the North American Review in 1887 by a resident of Kincardine, Ontario, named Hugh Black. In his article, Black maintains that the headstone that adorns Shakespeare's grave today is not the original headstone, but rather an 18th or 19th century replacement. According to Black, the epitaph on the original headstone, while bearing the same message as its replacement, contained alternating uppercase and lowercase letters, A's and B's, which, when decoded using Francis Bacon's binary alphabet, suggested a Shakespeare-Bacon connection. The notion that the headstone that currently marks Shakespeare's grave is a replacement is corroborated by an 1882 book written by Shakespearean scholar James Hallowell Phillips, entitled Outlines of the Life of Shakespeare. In his book, Hallowell Phillips maintains that the inscription on Shakespeare's tomb, designed to deter grave robbers and relic hunters from exhuming the poet's remains, was designed by a friend of Shakespeare's. This friend, Hallowell Phillips writes, knew that Shakespeare hated the idea of his bones being reinterred in the nearby charnel house, a vault where human skeletons, exhumed from their graves, are stored en masse in order to make room in the graveyard for fresh corpses, which was a common practice in Stratford-upon-Avon at that time. According to Hallowell Phillips, the warning on the inscription seems to have worked, as nobody has tampered with Shakespeare's remains. He continues, the honors of repose which have thus far been conceded to the poet's remains have not been extended to the tombstone. The latter had, by the middle of the last century, sank below the level of the floor, and about fifty years ago had become so much decayed as to suggest vandalic order for its removal and, in its stead, to place a new slab, one which marks certainly the locality of Shakespeare's grave and continues to record the farewell lines, but indicates nothing more. The original memorial has wandered from its allotted station no one can tell whither, a sacrifice to the insane worship of prosaic neatness, that mischievous demon whose votaries have practically destroyed so many of the priceless relics of ancient England and her gifted sons. In other words, Hallowell Phillips suggests that Shakespeare's original headstone, decrepit and sagging into the floor, was replaced in about 1825, and that the original stone was lost to history. A more recent discovery may shed some light on the reason behind the pitiful condition of Shakespeare's original headstone circa 1825. 
in order to commemorate the 400 year anniversary of Shakespeare's death, in the early spring of 2016, a team of archaeologists and geophysicists led by English historian Dr. Helen Castor used non-invasive ground-penetrating radar to conduct the first archaeological investigation of Shakespeare's grave. The team discovered that Shakespeare's skull appeared to be missing, and that a strange stone or concrete structure, possibly serving some sort of structural purpose, lay in the area where Shakespeare's head should be. The archaeologists concluded that their findings verified an old legend first published in an 1879 edition of the Argosy magazine, which states that Shakespeare's skull was stolen from Trinity Church by grave robbers in 1794. Perhaps the excavation carried out by those 18th century grave robbers, along with the lack of structural support brought about by the absence of Shakespeare's skull, contributed to the poor condition of the tombstone and the floor it was adhered to. If it is true that the original headstone of Shakespeare's grave was replaced, that the original headstone contained a secret code, and that the original headstone, and thus the code, was lost to history, the mystery would end there. However, an 18th slash 19th century English publisher named Charles Knight, while doing research for a Shakespeare biography, which was first published in 1843, copied the inscription on the original headstone and included it on page 535 of his work, William Shakespeare, a biography. The original inscription included a mix of uppercase and lowercase letters, seemingly placed in no rational order. Hugh Black, the author of the article in the 1887 North American Review, speculated that the inscription, with its seemingly random uppercase and lowercase letters, was actually a code that could be cracked using Bacon's binary alphabet. Accordingly, he did the following. First, he separated the text into five character blocks. He included the dashes between TE as characters. Next, he postulated that the uppercase letters were Bs and the lowercase letters were As. He included the dashes between the TEs as lowercase letters or As. Finally, he assigned each five character group a letter using Bacon's binary alphabet. At first glance, the supposed message appears to be nonsense. However, Black quickly anagrammed the letters to form the word Shakespeare. He further rearranged the remaining letters to form F R B A W R E A R A Y which he maintained stood for Francis Bacon wrote Shakespeare's plays. After that, the letters T and A remained. Although Amundsen was convinced that there might be something to Black's first step in forming the anagram Shakespeare from the decrypted letters, he wasn't so sure about the second part. He played with the letters and came up with W. Shakespeare and F.R.B.A. The F.R.B.A. apparently standing for Francis Bacon. He was left with the following letters. From here, Amundsen separated the remaining letters into two sections. Into one section he grouped the letters Y-E-T-A. In the original code solution, Y-E-T-A are the four letters that make up the middle section. They remain the four middle letters after W. Shakespeare and F-R-B-A are taken out. Amundsen also suspected that the letters Y-E-T-A, which seemed to be enclosed in the code solution, were somehow related to the inscription words, the dust enclosed here. Into the other section, he grouped the words R-A-A-R. -A -A At first glance, R-A-A-R -A -A appears to have no meaning. However, Amundsen rearranged the letters so that they spelled A-R-R-A. An arras is a fine wool tapestry with Flemish or French origins, which plays an important role in Shakespeare's play Hamlet. In Hamlet's Act 3, Scene 4, Hamlet, the protagonist, stabs and kills the character Polonius through an arras, behind which the latter was hiding. Later on, when a character asks Hamlet what he did with Polonius' body, he replies, I compounded it with dust. From this, Amundsen deduced that he should compound the word Y-E-T-A with the word dust. An old tradition in cryptography is to assign letters to numbers. In this system, the letter A is equal to 1, B equals 2, C equals 3, etc. In his book, Abacadarium, Francis Bacon apparently reveals in a roundabout way that he is familiar with this system. Amundsen compounded Y-E-T-A with D-U-S-T thusly, Y plus D, E plus U, T plus S, and A plus T. After he assigned each letter its numerical value and added them together, he got the values 27, 25, 37, and 20. The first three numbers here are too high to correspond with the letter of the alphabet. In order to rectify this, Amundsen subtracted 24 from the first three numbers and arrived at 3, 1, 13, and 20. Recall that the Latin alphabet, during Elizabethan and Jacobean times, only had 24 letters. These letters correspond with the letters C, A, and V, respectively. 
Amundsen replaced the letters Y-E-T-A in the original code solution with these new letters C-A-N-V, so that the new solution reads thus. Here, the name enclosed reveals itself to be F.R. Bacon. In the end, the solution reveals the words W. Shakespeare, F.R. Bacon. The remaining letters are A-R-R-A and V. Amundsen speculated that the V stood for Verulam, a title in the Peerage of England which Bacon owned. Although this supposed solution of a supposed code on Shakespeare's gravestone is far from being concrete proof that Francis Bacon was the real author of the Shakespearean works, it was enough to cause Petter Amundsen to abandon his original search for the code in Gans, A Tunnel Through the Air, and concentrate wholeheartedly on getting to the bottom of the Shakespearean mystery. By now, you might be wondering what Francis Bacon's supposed authorship of the Shakespearean works has to do with Oak Island. The answer, according to Petter Amundsen, lies in Shakespeare's First Folio. The First Folio was the first collected edition of William Shakespeare's plays. It was published in 1623, seven years after Shakespeare's death, by John Hemingus and Henry Condell, actors of the King's Men Playing Company for which Shakespeare wrote his plays. Before the First Folio was published in 1623, a number of Shakespeare's plays had already been published individually in quarto. A quarto is a booklet comprised of pages which have been folded in half, twice, to make four double-sided pages. However, as many of these early quarto editions were considered bad quartos, quartos which were pirated by audience members who attended the performances of Shakespeare's plays and wrote down the scripts as they heard them, and as all of Shakespeare's original handwritten manuscripts have been lost to history, the first folio was considered to be one of the earliest and most authentic publications of the Shakespearean works. In the 2006 book, Organa Sten, Amundsen reveals a myriad of what he claims to be secret messages and clues linking the Shakespearean works with Francis Bacon, Freemasonry, and Rosicrucianism, hidden inside the first folio. Specifically, Amundsen claims that these alleged clues imply that Francis Bacon was the actual author of the Shakespearean works, and that the Shakespearean works were a Rosicrucian project. Some of these clues are manifest in acrostic messages, in which the first letter of each line spells out a message vertically down the page. Others Amundsen reveals by counting words, lines, and pages using Masonic and Rosicrucian numbers, as well as the numerical values of particular words, such as Francis Bacon and Poet. Others still, Amundsen uncovers by drawing Masonic shapes and symbols, like Pythagorean 345 triangles, pentagons, circles, and the Masonic square and compass, directly onto pages of the first folio reversing words, numbers, and geometric shapes, taking note of the mysterious typographical and page numbering errors, translating English words and letters into Latin and Greek, identifying anagrams, and interpreting plays on words. In addition, Amundsen uses these same methods to find similar clues in the works of Francis Bacon and Ben Jonson, a 17th century English playwright and poet who was a friend of Shakespeare's and a close associate of Francis Bacon, as well as in the plaque on Shakespeare's funerary monument, located in Stratford-upon-Avon's Trinity Church, in which Shakespeare is buried. To the skeptic, many of these supposed clues appear to be the result of nothing more than coincidence when considered individually. However, the sheer magnitude of Amundsen's findings, coupled with a handful of particularly convincing pieces of evidence, give credence to the notion that the Norwegian organ player might be onto something. Why would Francis Bacon hide the fact that he was a true author of the Shakespearean works? Why wouldn't he take credit for the spectacular plays and poetry which have come to be regarded as some of the greatest achievements in the history of English literature? Amundsen, along with many so-called Baconians who believe Francis Bacon was the true author of the Shakespearean plays and sonnets, believes that Bacon did this so as to not hinder his political career. Bacon was a noble, and during the Elizabethan and Jacobean eras, it was seen as unbecoming for someone of the upper class to write verse and dramatic poetry. Furthermore, much of the content of the Shakespearean works is politically volatile, and could land its author, were he a member of the upper class, in serious trouble. Another question that arises when considering the possibility that Francis Bacon wrote all of the Shakespearean works is that of where Bacon found the time to complete them. There are a total of 835,997 words in Shakespeare's plays alone. It would have taken a single man a tremendous amount of time to conceive of, pen, and edit such a quantitatively tremendous and qualitatively exquisite volume of work, and Francis Bacon was not an idle man. The English nobleman accomplished an impressive amount in his 65 years under his own name. As mentioned, he was a parliamentarian, a jurist, a scientist, and a philosopher, 
who wrote a number of texts relevant to his professions. Amundsen addresses this question by stating that it is entirely possible that Bacon received help in writing the Shakespearean plays and sonnets from fellow Rosicrucians. He maintains that a number of these free thinkers might have worked under the supervision of Bacon, who was likely their leader, and published their collective content under the name of an up-and-coming actor from Stratford-upon-Avon named William Shakespeare, with whom they had made a deal. Amundsen goes on to point out a number of hidden messages in Shakespeare's plays and sonnets, which, when combined with other secret messages found in the writings of Francis Bacon, Ben Jonson, and the Rosicrucian Manifestos, apparently illustrate a celestial map using stars and constellations. The hidden messages seem to indicate that a treasure of some kind is buried at a point where the star Deneb was in zenith over the Earth in the early 1600s, a point which appears to be one of the many islands off the coast of Nova Scotia. Amundsen uncovers secret messages in various 17th century documents which suggest that this island was Gloucester Island, an early name for the place we know today as Oak Island. Interestingly, the idea that Francis Bacon might somehow be connected with Oak Island is not a new one. A number of books linking Bacon with the island have been written by various authors since the 1930s. Up until Peter Amundsen, however, most of these writers have based their suppositions on two different Oak Island discoveries. The first of these discoveries was made in 1897 by the Oak Island Treasure Company. While drilling to a depth of 153 feet at the money pit, the company recovered a small piece of sheepskin parchment, about the size of a dime, with the letters VI handwritten on it in India ink with a quill pen. According to some accounts, when later tested, it was revealed the scrap of parchment contained traces of mercury. Today, this piece of parchment resides in Dan Blankenship's small personal museum on Oak Island. Also, in 1937, several thousand pieces of broken pottery were discovered by Gilbert Hedden at Jowdry's Cove on Oak Island. These pottery shards also contained traces of mercury. Some speculate that the presence of mercury on Oak Island artifacts, combined with the parchment discovered on the drill bit, is evidence that Francis Bacon was somehow connected. Bacon, in his natural history book Silva Silvarum, writes briefly about how quicksilver or mercury can be used to preserve bodies such as flowers. To summarize thus far, Petter Amundsen has purportedly unearthed a number of secret messages hidden in various 17th century publications, including the writings of Francis Bacon and Ben Jonson, the Rosicrucian Manifestos, and Shakespeare's First Folio, which indicate that Francis Bacon was a true author of the Shakespearean works, that there is a treasure buried on an island somewhere off the coast of Nova Scotia, and that the island in question is probably Oak Island. These claims give rise to a number of questions. Who buried this treasure on Oak Island? Where exactly on the island did they bury the treasure? What does this treasure consist of? Why was the treasure buried in the first place? Amundsen believes that his research has already revealed the answers to the first question. Many of the hidden messages which helped Amundsen to arrive at the conclusions he did were revealed through the use of Rosicrucian and Masonic numbers in geometry. From this, Amundsen deduced that the people who buried the Oak Island treasure were probably Rosicrucians either sympathizers with the Rosicrucian philosophy, or members of an actual Rosicrucian fraternity, or some sort of proto-Freemasons, or perhaps both. Judging from the content of the plethora of hidden messages he claims to have unearthed, Amundsen also believes that Francis Bacon somehow had a major role in the treasure's burial. Amundsen believes that the answer to the question of the treasure's exact location can be found by studying Nolan's cross which Amundsen believes is not only an artificially created Christian cross, but also the skeleton of a larger, man-made Tree of Life. The Tree of Life is a Judaic Kabbalistic symbol which represents one of the two trees in the Garden of Eden described in the Book of Genesis, the other being the Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil, which bore the fruit which Adam and Eve disobediently ate. The Tree of Life has ten sephirot, or attributes, which represent the nature of divinity, According to Fama Fraternitatis, the first Rosicrucian Manifesto, Rosicrucians were both Christians and Kabbalists, practitioners of Kabbalah. Therefore, according to Amundsen, Nolan's cross, being both a cross and a tree of life, would be a perfectly appropriate Rosicrucian symbol. When Amundsen projected the tree of life onto Nolan's cross, it fit perfectly. Amundsen believed that the key to the Oak Island treasure lay at the site of one of the Sephirots, and intended to travel to Oak Island to investigate the points himself. Upon contacting David Tobias, one of the two partners of the so-called Triton Alliance, 
Petter Amundsen received permission to investigate his hypothetical Sephiroths for three days in the spring of 2003. On May 25, 2003, he arrived on Oak Island with a small crew and immediately set about measuring the distance between the tips of the conical stones that made up Nolan's Cross. As anticipated, the length between the stones was perfectly congruent with the corresponding Sephiroths on the Tree of Life. Amundsen and his crew went on to investigate several of the sites where Sephiroths would be if the Tree of Life was projected onto Nolan's Cross. The first one they investigated was Kingdom, at the bottom of the Tree of Life. Although a metal detector found no traces of metal in the area, a quick manual dig revealed that a large, flat stone lay buried at the Kingdom site just below the surface. After finding the flat stone at the Kingdom point, the crew located the Victory point. There, the crew found another flat stone similar to the one they had found at the Kingdom point. After finding the Victory stone, the crew rode into the middle of Oak Island's triangular swamp on a dinghy in search of the Mercy point. Although the crew found the point with little difficulty, they could do little more. The Mercy Point is covered by several meters of swampy water. Having done all they could in the time allotted to them, Amundsen and his team packed it in and returned to Norway. Somewhat crestfallen, Amundsen returned to the aforementioned 17th century manuscripts to see what he had missed. In those books, he discovered what he believes to be clear indications that the Mercy Point is the precise location at which the treasure is buried. The problem with the Mercy Point, however, is that it is located in the center of Oak Island's triangular swamp. If something were indeed buried at the Mercy Point, it follows that the Oak Island swamp might possibly be a man-made pond, constructed in order to hide the burial spot, a theory which treasure hunters Dan Blankenship and Fred Nolan have held for years, and that at least one among those who buried the treasure on Oak Island was an engineering genius who possessed the technology and the skill to manipulate vast quantities of water. Fortunately for Amundsen, one such aquatic engineer was a close associate of Francis Bacon. 17th century British mining engineer Thomas Bushell was Bacon's servant from 1608 to 1621, when Bacon was impeached on charges of corruption. Bushell was one of Bacon's servants who had accepted bribes from people engaged in lawsuits on his master's behalf. When Bacon was convicted, Bushell disappeared for three years. Some believe he retired to the Isle of Wight in the Irish Sea, where he lived disguised as a fisherman. Amundsen, however, using passages from Bushell's 1659 book Abridgment as evidence, believes Bacon sent him on a special mission to the New World, possibly to oversee digging operations on Oak Island. After a three years absence, Bushell returned to England. He remained there until Francis Bacon's death in 1626, whereupon he left England again, ostensibly travelling to either Lundy, another island in the Irish Sea, or the Calf of Man, a tiny island off the southwest coast of the Isle of Man. Amundsen instead believes he went back to Oak Island in order to carry out Francis Bacon's last request. Bushell eventually returned to England in 1628, where he made a name for himself as Britain's foremost mining engineer. One of his specialties was the manipulation of water. Amundsen believes that it is possible that Bushell, during his extended absences, buried a treasure on Oak Island through the use of penal labor, a subject on which Bushell has written. Then, using his aquatic engineering expertise, he manipulated fresh water that was already on the island and drowned the burial site in a swamp. If Bushell and company really did bury something on Oak Island, what was it? Amundsen maintains that clues in Bushell's writings, as well as those in the writings of Francis Bacon, the first of the Rosicrucian manifestos, and an inscription below the Francis Bacon tomb slash monument in St. Michael's Church in St. Albans, UK, suggests that the Oak Island treasure might include a mummified body, a number of specially preserved manuscripts, the menorah, and possibly even the Ark of the Covenant. If Amundsen's theory is to be believed, we know the when, the who, the where, and the what behind the treasure buried on Oak Island. One final question remains. Why was the treasure buried in the first place? Amundsen believes that the Rosicrucian Proto-Masonic Europeans who buried a body, secret manuscripts, the menorah, and the Ark of the Covenant on Oak Island in the 1600s were realizing an ancient dream shared by many Orthodox Jews and fundamentalist Christians, specifically the construction of the Third Temple, a holy temple prophesied in the Book of Ezekiel. In Jewish tradition, and according to Masonic and Kabbalist teachings, 
The first temple, also known as Solomon's Temple, was built in the mid-10th century BC on the orders of Hebrew King Solomon. This temple, which was erected on what is now the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, housed the Ark of the Covenant and the menorah in an inner sanctuary known as the Holy of Holies. According to rabbinic literature and the Hebrew Bible, the first temple was destroyed in 587 BC by the armies of the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar II. The Babylonians razed the town and kept meticulous records of their plunder. Although their booty included temple treasures, the menorah and the Ark of the Covenant were never mentioned. According to the Old Testament, the Jewish people built a second temple on Jerusalem's Temple Mount in 516 BC. Between 20 and 19 BC, the Judeo-Roman client king Herod the Great expanded it on a massive scale. Thereafter, the second temple was also known as Herod's Temple. Herod's Temple stood until 70 AD, when Roman legions under the Emperor Titus sacked Jerusalem and razed much of the city. Ever since the destruction of the Second Temple, many Orthodox Jews and later Fundamentalist Christians have yearned to see the construction of a Third Temple on Jerusalem's Temple Mount, as prophesied in the Book of Ezekiel. The most obvious impediment to realizing such a goal is the fact that the Temple Mount in Jerusalem has been dominated by the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the iconic Dome of the Rock, both Islamic structures built under the Umayyad Caliphate since the 7th century AD. In order to build the Third Temple in accordance with the specifications laid out in the Book of Ezekiel, one of these historic Islamic structures would have to be destroyed. Fortunately, Amundsen believes that a Third Temple of sorts is already built on Oak Island. He speculates that Bushel and the Rosicrucians used boulders to construct a temple layout which unified the Christian cross with the Jewish Tree of Life, Nolan's Cross. Underneath this third temple, they buried the menorah and the Ark of the Covenant, two of the most sacred artifacts in Judeo-Christian tradition. Specifically, Amundsen believes that Rosicrucians buried the temple treasures at the Mercy Point, which is located in the middle of the Oak Island Swamp. Amundsen's theory first appeared in print in the 2006 book Organisten, or The Organist, renamed The Seven Steps to Mercy, by Norwegian novelist Erland Lowe. Organisten is essentially a series of edited interviews in which Amundsen explains his theory to Lowe, along with a truly impressive, complicated, and often interconnected assortment of evidence for it. In 2009, Amundsen presented his theory again this time in the form of a four-part TV miniseries directed by Jorgen Freiburg, called Sweet Swan of Avon. In this TV series, which first aired on Norway's largest TV station, NRK1, Amundsen has his theory assessed by a number of academic professionals, including Shakespearean scholar Professor Stanley Wells, Rosicrucian scholar Tobias Churton, cryptographic historian David Kahn, and 17th century print expert Jola Sigmund. In 2013, Amundsen's theory was showcased in a documentary directed by Jorgen Freiburg, entitled Shakespeare the Hidden Truth. In this film, Shakespearean scholar Dr. Robert Crumpton confronts Amundsen in an attempt to debunk his theory that the Shakespearean works were not in fact written by William Shakespeare of Stratford-upon-Avon. The inconsonant pair embark upon an adventure which takes them to Norway, England, Switzerland, and ultimately to Oak Island. That same year, in the summer, Amundsen worked with the film crew of the History Channel's TV series The Curse of Oak Island. This work was later showcased in the show's fourth episode, The Secret of Solomon's Temple, which first aired on January 26, 2014. In the episode, Amundsen submits his theory to Rick and Marty Lagina. Later in the episode, Amundsen sets out with Marty and Marty's son Alex to search for a hypothetical stone buried at the Kingdom Point, which Amundsen had actually discovered years earlier during his 2003 visit to Oak Island. However, since Amundsen's 2003 adventure, Dan Blankenship had reburied the stone in order to hide the potential breakthrough from rival treasure hunter Fred Nolan. Amundsen, who was not entirely sure where the stone was reburied, guided the Laginas to the stone's general location, and unwittingly selected the wrong stone to unearth. While the trio dug it up, Marty recited relevantly adulterated lines from Robert Service's The Cremation of Sam McGee, while Amundsen winced to himself, realizing halfway through that he had indeed selected the wrong stone. When the stone was finally dug up, Amundsen admitted his error, much to the chagrin of the Lagina father and son. The Norwegian organist was saved from further humiliation thanks to the resourcefulness of Alex Lagina, who promptly identified the correct stone, 
which the trio immediately unearthed. According to Amundsen in a 2015 addendum to Organa Sten, his relationship with the Lagina brothers and with the Curse of Oak Island's production team came to an abrupt end in 2014, when he publicly supported an amendment to Nova Scotia's Bill 40, the Oak Island Treasure Act. Specifically, Amundsen supported a proposal submitted by Denise Patterson Rafuse, the MLA of Chester, Nova Scotia, that there should be a stipulation that Oak Island treasure hunters have their work supervised by an archaeologist. The Laginos and the TV show's producers were in staunch opposition to this proposition, ostensibly fearing that having an archaeologist on board might greatly hinder excavation projects. Amundsen further elaborates upon his theory in his own 2014 book entitled Oak Island and the Treasure Map in Shakespeare. In this book, he fleshes out concepts he introduced in Organa Sten, and presents many new pieces of supporting evidence which he has gleaned from various 17th century publications and artwork. In January 2017, Amundsen published another TV series entitled Cracking the Shakespeare Code, which he created with director Jorgen Freiburg. This documentary is essentially an updated version of Oak Island and the Treasure Map in Shakespeare, featuring Amundsen and his foil, British Shakespearean Robert Crumpton. Another Scandinavian who has recently claimed to have discovered hidden messages in early Shakespearean publications is the Swedish Oak Island researcher and self-styled amateur historic cryptographer Daniel Ronstam. While Amundsen found a myriad of supposed codes in the plays of the 1623 First Folio, Ronstam maintains that he has uncovered a cryptographic map in a private document and in the 1609 quarto edition of Shakespeare's Sonnets. This map which he claims took him five years to decrypt, leads to a large boulder located in the wilderness of Lunenburg County, Nova Scotia, with a large X carved into its side. In March 2014, the vicinity of this boulder was scanned using ground-penetrating radar. When analyzed by professionals, the results apparently revealed unnatural features a few meters directly under the boulder. Ron Stam believes this boulder is connected with the Oak Island mystery and, using the evidence he has uncovered, has formulated his own Oak Island theory. Firstly, Ron Stam subscribes to the majority of Petter Amundsen's Rosicrucian theory. He believes that Francis Bacon was the true author of the Shakespearean works, and that the Shakespearean works were a Rosicrucian project designed not only to enlighten the European masses, but also to hide secret messages, which ultimately culminate in a treasure map leading to Oak Island. Ronstam does not share Amundsen's opinion that the Rosicrucian treasure is buried on Oak Island. Instead, he believes that English noblemen, who were members of the Rosicrucian fraternity, came to Oak Island in the early 17th century to bury encrypted documents with the aid of Spanish laborers. Together, Ronstam believes that these documents will reveal another treasure map, which was created through the use of triangulation and bonfire beacons. This treasure map will lead to the mainland, specifically to the boulder in Lunenburg County. This boulder, Ronstam implies, is where the treasure is actually buried. If the Rosicrucians did bury encrypted documents on Oak Island, where exactly did they bury them? Ronstam believes that some of the documents were buried in the money pit. Specifically, he believes that the scrap of parchment with the letters VI written on it, which was recovered from the money pit at a depth of 153 feet by the Oak Island Treasure Company in 1897, is a piece of a copy of the aforementioned private document, which Ronstam decrypted to find the treasure map leading to the Lunenburg County boulder. He also predicts, using evidence he has gleaned from various 17th century publications and woodcuts, that more enciphered documents are stored in a box located in the Money Pit Swamp, probably at Petter Amundsen's Mercy Point. Daniel Ronstam has also developed another Oak Island theory related to the large flat stone inscribed with strange markings, apparently recovered in the money pit at a depth of 90 feet in 1803. Although the stone has been lost to history, some believe that the mysterious inscription on it was copied down on paper at some point. The earliest copy of the supposed inscription comes from a letter sent by Reverend A.T. Kempton to Oak Island treasure hunter Frederick Blair in April 1949. The symbols in Kempton's letter can also be found in Edward Rowe Snow's 1949 book True Tales of Buried Treasure. It should be mentioned that many serious Oak Island researchers doubt that the Kempton symbols are genuine. The symbols found in Kempton's letter have been analyzed by a number of researchers over the years. One researcher, a man described by Kempton as an old Irish schoolmaster, 
determined that the inscription was a simple substitution cipher which, when decrypted, reads, 40 feet below, 2 million pounds are buried. In 1971, Dr. Ross Wilhelm, a Michigan professor who had worked as a codebreaker during World War II, noted the similarities between the Kempton symbols and the characters used on a cipher disc. In De Furtivis Literarum Notis Volgo, a book written by Italian cryptographer Giovanni Battista della Porta, which was published in Naples in 1563. A large part of Della Porta's book describes a polyalphabetic enciphering method which he had developed. Della Porta's method was based on the Alberti cipher disc, developed by Italian Renaissance man Leon Battista Alberti in 1466. Using Della Porta's method, Dr. Wilhelm created his own cipher disc using the Kempton symbols and the 16th century Spanish alphabet. However, he had to omit several of the Kempton symbols to make the cipher disc work. Wilhelm was not particularly perturbed by the necessity of this extra step, knowing that it was a common practice for cryptographers to include irrelevant red herring symbols in their ciphers in order to confuse code breakers. Dr. Wilhelm used the cipher disc he had created to decrypt the 90-foot stone inscription. A Spanish message emerged. The message he revealed read, A ochenta guia mi corria sumidero f. This translates to, At 80 guide millet estuary or firth drain f. Ronstam speculates that the F at the end stands for Francis Bacon. Ronstam believes the simple substitution message, 40 feet below 2 million pounds are buried, was a trap designed to entice unworthy treasure hunters who lacked advanced cryptographic skills to dig deeper into the money pit and trigger the flood tunnels. He interprets the more complicated double cipher message at 80 Guide Millet Estuary or Firth Drain F as an instruction to intercept the flood tunnels at 80 feet below the surface and pour massive amounts of dry millet or corn into them. Dry corn, which expands in water, would hypothetically block the flood tunnels temporarily until it had rotted, allowing the money pit excavators to continue their dig for some time without any aquatic interference. The Wilhelm Ronstam message was extremely difficult to produce, requiring extensive amounts of time and cryptographic knowledge. Ronstam believes that the Rosicrucians who crafted the cipher never intended it to be so difficult to decrypt, and provided information on how to construct the cipher wheel with which to decrypt it on a keystone. Ronstam suspects this keystone might have been the boulder inscribed with mysterious markings, which was discovered by Gilbert Hedden in Jaudry's Cove in 1936. Unfortunately, this stone was later dynamited by treasure hunters who thought something might be buried beneath it. As mentioned earlier, many Oak Island researchers seriously doubt the authenticity of the 1949 Kempton symbols, in part because the cipher they comprise is too simplistic. However, Ronstam believes that the fact that these symbols can be decrypted into two different messages in two different languages using two different cipher messages strongly suggests that the symbols indeed constituted an intentional double cipher created by someone well versed in cryptography. Whether the Kempton symbols were actually the symbols inscribed in the 90-foot stone or simply an elaborate hoax is up for conjecture. Ronstam appeared in Season 2 of the History Channel's TV series The Curse of Oak Island in an episode entitled The 90-Foot Stone. In that episode, he ran his dual cipher theory by Rick and Marty Lagina and the Oak Island team. Ronstam outlines much of his theory on his website, oakislandproject.com. There he has hinted that he is privy to additional evidence and has developed some accompanying theories, which he will present in an upcoming book. In Season 5, Episode 5 and 6, two human bones were discovered in the spoils of Borehole H8. The fact that human bones were discovered in the Money Pit corresponds perfectly with the Rosicrucian theory, which holds that one of the items interred in the Money Pit is a human corpse. The bones from H8 were later determined to have come from two individuals of European and Middle Eastern extraction, respectively. Both of these ethnicities seem consistent with the Rosicrucian theory, the European one for obvious reasons, and the Middle Eastern one on account of the fact that Rosicrucian history and philosophy, as described in the manifestos, has strong ties to North Africa and the Middle East. Alternatively, it could be supposed that the Middle Eastern bone came from a slave which the Rosicrucians employed in the construction of the Money Pit, perhaps a Barbary pirate captured by the English Navy. In Season 5, Episode 8, the European bone was carbon dated from 1678 to 1764, while the Middle Eastern bone was carbon dated from 1682 to 1736. 
these dates, it must be mentioned, post-date the most popular iteration of the Rosicrucian theory by about half a century. In Season 5, Episode 6, fragments of what were later determined to be parchment and leather, the latter bearing evidence of its employment as a cover for a manuscript, were discovered in Borehole H8. This find corresponds with the Rosicrucian theory, which holds that the money pit contains some sort of precious document, perhaps the last manuscripts of William Shakespeare, handwritten by Sir Francis Bacon. In Season 6, Episode 13, the men of Oak Island Tours, Inc. unearthed more pieces of leather and parchment, as well as a scrap of paper bearing yellow and red paint from Borehole H8. In Season 5, Episode 16, Gary Drayton discovered a rhodolite garnet brooch on Oak Island's Lot 8. In the Season 5 finale, an unnamed gemologist determined that the artifact was crafted in the 16th or 17th century, a date range which corresponds with the Rosicrucian theory. Do you believe it's possible the Rosicrucians buried some sort of treasure on Oak Island? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video and would like to support this channel, please check out the Oak Island Encyclopedia by clicking the link in the description.